today, I want to just dive into our second reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. St. Paul begins by asking us to work for unity in the church. Remember, he, he writes, If there is any encouragement in Christ, any solace in love, any participation in the Spirit, any compassion and mercy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. I can't think of many more timely messages. It's like St. Paul is writing to the Universal Catholic Church right now in 2020, writing to a Catholic Church racked by scandal and navigating a pandemic. It's like St. Paul is writing to the church in, in the United States right now, in 2020, a U.S. church racked by our own scandals and trying to navigate not only a pandemic, but a contentious election. And in that vein, it's tempting, I think, especially for American Catholics, to read our own polarized politics into this text. That would be called eisegesis, reading my own experience, my own interpretation into the text. But what actually, what actually is the division that Paul is preaching against in this reading? Well, he himself tells us, he says, do nothing out of selfishness or out of vainglory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not for his own interests, but also for those of others. The disunity and division that Paul is preaching against is the very disunity and division wrought by sin. This is not Paul being all, why can't we all just get along? No, this is Paul confronting the very heart of sin itself and directing our eyes to the one person who can free us from the dividing and disunifying voices and effects of that sin. Now, I can't speak for you, but I know that for myself, I have often been the source of division and disunity through my own sinfulness. Unfortunately, I am and can be a very selfish and prideful person. And with reverence, my brothers and sisters, I submit that we all are, all of us, selfish and prideful, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Indeed, pride, which is at the heart of selfishness and vainglory, well, pride is the original sin itself, the root of that concupiscent drive to look only to look out only for numero uno. This selfishness, this self-centeredness, this pride and vainglory that I see so much in myself is indeed the original sin, the sin at the heart of so many of the ills and evils in our world. I dare say at the heart of all of them. Just turn on the TV. And in the face of all of this sin and division, St. Paul comes in with his words of clarity. Do nothing out of selfishness, nothing out of vainglory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not only for his own interests, but for those of others. And why? Well, here's where St. Paul gets to the heart of the matter. He says, Have in you the same attitude that is also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and found in human appearance, 
He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay, so let's unpack that. There's a lot there. Having you the same attitude that is in Christ Jesus. What is the attitude, the attitude we are called to have as disciples? Well, we're told that Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Right there. I want to grasp, right? I want to take. Remember, I've got to look out for numero uno. I've got to get mine. And so I grasp, I take. But Jesus did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. I grasp at money and wealth and sex and comfort. I grasp at these meager, creaturely things. But Jesus could have grasped at being divine himself, at holding on to his divinity. But he did not see that as something to be grasped at. Rather, what did he do? He emptied himself. He became obedient to the point of death on a cross. Okay, so let's unpack that some more. First, that emptying. Jesus emptied himself. The Greek word there is kenosis, literally self-emptying. The image is of like a water jug, a vessel that empties itself completely of its contents. We're told that that's what Jesus did. He emptied himself. Kenosis, self-emptying, is not just what Jesus does. It is who he is, who God is. St. John tells us that God is love, and we think, oh, that's nice. God is that warm, fuzzy feeling. When, no, God is love because love is total self-gift. Total pouring out, total self-emptying, total complete kenosis. Love, true love, takes nothing, grasps nothing. True love only seeks to give. Love is the parent, true love is the parent who would do literally anything for their child. True love is the stay-at-home mom who cooks and cleans and chases the kids around all day until she's drained of every ounce of energy she has and then the baby spat up its lunch and so now she's got to go love some more, give some more. Love gives and doesn't count the cost. Love never takes. Love never grasps. Love never uses. Love gives. How different this is from the selfishness and the self-centeredness and the pride that I see in myself all too often. How counter to it, how utterly opposite. I say that I've got to look out for numero uno. I've got to get mine. Jesus empties himself, gives totally in the incarnation on the cross. In one more place, we'll get to that. But not only that, there's not only the emptying, but after emptying himself to become like a human being, to become a human being fully, Jesus becomes obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In his obedience, in his acceptance of his cross, not my will, Father, but thy will be done, Jesus shows us the way that is infinitely higher than our temptations to selfishness, our temptations to vainglory and pride, our temptations to take and grasp. In his obedience, Jesus wins for us freedom from sin. Freedom from that grasping, taking, the endless cycle of selfishness and theft that we inflict upon each other in sin. 
in my sinfulness, I far too often see you not as a person, not as a human being with your own thoughts and feelings and desires. No, far too often in my sinfulness, I see you as a means to an end, a means for my own pleasure, my own gain. But for Jesus Christ, a human person is never a means to an end, but an end in themselves. Jesus didn't die on the cross to get something from us. He died on the cross to give himself totally to us, to empty himself for us. And my friends, this is something that we see in a liturgical way, every single Mass. Think about it. We come from our varied professions and families and economic situations. We come from our differing opinions. We come to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And here at this altar, we do not seek to take. Rather, we give our simple gifts of bread and wine. And we witness as the priest offers the bread and the wine to the Father, and then the Father gives them back to us as his Son. And then the priest offers the Son to the Father, through him, with him, in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. That is the priest in persona Christi offering Jesus to the Father, just like Jesus did on Calvary. And then the Father doesn't keep him for himself, but gives him back to us again in Holy Communion. That giving and receiving, that mutual self-emptying, that is worship. That is what happens in the Mass. I said that Jesus emptied himself out in the Incarnation. Jesus emptied himself out on the cross, and the third place is here, when Jesus empties himself out into the bread, into the chalice. So they are no longer bread, but his body, no longer wine, but his blood. This is a liturgical expression of what we are called to do out there. Do nothing out of selfishness or vainglory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not for his own interests, but for those of others. This is what our world needs. It does not need yet another political opinion. It does not need another debate. The world needs Jesus Christ. The world needs Christians who act like Christians. The world needs Catholics who live out the challenge that we receive from St. Paul today. Have in you the same attitude, the same attitude that is also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself and took the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. Coming in human likeness and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even into death, death on the cross. This is how Jesus loves us. This is how we are called to love.